the simplest items can tell the greatest tales. I'm Matt McLaughlin. Join me as we go behind the scenes at the world's great museums, libraries and archives to explore the artefacts that helped shape history. This is Treasures from the Vault. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. December 7, 1941. The attack on Pearl Harbor was not only America's greatest military defeat, it also plunged the world into the Pacific War. Ten weeks later, the same aircraft carrier task force that had attacked Pearl Harbor had set its sights on a new target, the northern Australian township of Darwin. The Japanese were advancing through Indonesia and they were determined to knock out the substantial naval and air bases at Darwin to prevent the Allies from using them to counterattack Japanese forces. On the morning of February 19, 1942, nearly 250 aircraft launched from carriers and airfields bombed Darwin. It was the first of more than 100 raids on Northern Australia that would take place in the next two years. Darwin was completely unprepared. It was only lightly defended with limited anti-aircraft guns and few fighter aircraft. In less than an hour, the town was virtually destroyed. 11 ships were sunk and more than 250 people were killed. The Second World War had come to Australia. One of the Japanese pilots in the skies above Darwin that day was 21-year-old Hajime Toyashima. He was a skilled pilot, flying the fearsome Japanese Zero fighter, and although he had not taken part in the attack on Pearl Harbor, he was looking forward to coming to grips with Allied airmen in the skies over Darwin. Toyoshima was disappointed. The Allied air response was feeble, and most of the Japanese fighters returned to their aircraft carriers without having fired a shot at an enemy plane. As Toyoshima turned to head for home, he came under fire from machine guns on the ground, and one lucky shot pierced his engine. Toyoshima Zero was mortally wounded and he was forced to crash land on nearby Melville Island. Toyoshima was captured by a group of indigenous men and became Australia's first Japanese prisoner of the war. More importantly, his aircraft was the first intact Japanese Zero to fall into Allied hands. Intelligence officers stripped at bare, examining every panel and rivet and gaining vital intelligence about the formidable Japanese aircraft. Today, the remains of the plane are in the Darwin Aviation Museum, and I examined them with local military historian Norm Cramp. One of the, um, uh, the really interesting things about this aircraft or the wreck was it was the first uh, Zero fighter that was captured by the Allies virtually intact. The, um, the Zeros that were shot down uh, over Pearl Harbour um, or in other parts of uh, while the Japanese were advancing had, had never been recovered. They, and if they were recovered, they were too badly damaged for the intelligence people to, and the uh, aviation engineers to find the secrets of the Zero. Why was it so good? Yeah. So on that day, on the 19th of February 1942, this aircraft was one of the 188 that were launched from the four aircraft carriers, the same, the same battle squadron that had attacked Pearl Harbor in December of 41. Uh, that uh, one of those aircraft, this particular the aircraft, uh, was flown by a flight sergeant, Hijimi Toyoshima. He uh, was a young man, as you would expect a fighter pilot to be. He was born um, just outside of, uh, to the southeast of uh, Tokyo in uh, Kagawa Prefecture. 
a small little village. Uh, his, uh, his parents were farmers, uh, probably almost peasants, I would imagine. He was educated uh, in Osaka uh, to the secondary school level. He was a good student, apparently. And while he was at that school, he was imbued with this Japanese tradition of uh, death before dishonour, that um, men were the, um, they were the leaders, they were to be brave, they were to be upstanding, they weren't to bow, you know, they were to, to defend Japan and all this sort of stuff. His father um, apparently was reasonably well connected because getting into the military uh, in those days and particularly into the Imperial Japanese Navy, if you went in as a, as a normal rating, I mean, just a deckhand, so to speak, but... This, this fellow uh, goes into the, um, the Imperial Japanese Navy um, air, air training school. So he's pretty clever. And whether there was some political connection there or uh, don't know. But he graduated from the, um, the flying school in, I think it was June 1941. They're getting ready for the big breakout. I was always of the view that when... Uh, Toyoshima came here that um, with that first raid that he had been a part of the raid, the attack on Pearl Harbor. But we now know that he wasn't, that his part in the raid on Darwin was his first and only combat mission. So the ships that attacked Pearl Harbor returned to Japan, refitted, resupplied, and then came out again to attack Darwin, didn't they? That's that's correct. And so they, his aircraft was probably involved in the attack on Pearl yeah, Harbor, yep. but not I, I him would, himself. I would think so. And the, um, the attack on Darwin was, uh, as you say, Matt, off the same aircraft carriers. The, the attacks were led by the, the same uh, Japanese Navy personnel. Um, uh, General uh, Admiral Yamamoto had signed the attack plan 10 days before, so Darwin's uh, destruction was sealed. That's it. It's going to happen. Toyoshima uh, took part in that, that uh, first raid, he, his was the only aircraft that never returned to his aircraft carrier that day. There's some conjecture, some debate still going on about what happened to his aircraft. Um, one, one view is a possibility is that he actually ran out of fuel. Is, um, when, he, when he landed the aircraft on Melville Island uh, with a, in a wheels-up belly landing, the amazing thing is that he still had his drop tank the drop tank was still attached to the aircraft. Now, so this is a, a drop tank is a, a fuel tank that is uh, used to give particularly fighters extra range. And once you've used up the fuel in that tank, they jettison it and it's abandoned. That's correct. And um, generally, they use that reserve tank to get them to the uh, the attack site. They jettisoned the uh, the drop tanks, as we call them, so that when they went into into the attack. The, the fighter was flying as it was designed to fight. The, um, the auxiliary tank, the drop tanks, slowed them down. It burned up a lot more fuel and it made them um, a lot less manoeuvrable. And so why uh, Toyoshima still had uh, his auxiliary tank is unknown. He, he never, he refused to be interviewed. Um, he was um, really... Uh, the epitome of the uh, traditional Japanese uh, warrior at that stage. You know, they, uh, they, they didn't like being taken prisoner. So Toyoshima belly lands on Melville Island, yep. was it? Yep. And what happened to him then? Because the story of his capture is a quite a story in its own right. <laughs> well, you know, most people think that uh, when he landed the, uh, the aircraft, the uh, Aboriginal people went there and took him prisoner, and that's uh, not what happened. He... He decided to make for the coast. His view was that if he could get to the coast and make himself um, known there, that he knew that they would uh, that they would send uh, observation craft looking for him. They wanted to know. They would want to know if the aircraft was totally destroyed or whatever. So he um, it was. It seems to me he was uh, disoriented. Uh, he he had suffered a really bad. Uh, banged to his head when he landed the when he crash landed the aircraft. He 
smacked his uh, forehead against um, the part of the cockpit. He had a, a quite a serious wound above his right eye. Uh, it, I don't know if he was uh, knocked unconscious, but it certainly, you know, he would have been knocked senseless, uh, probably concussion or whatever. So he gets out of the aircraft um, and he heads into the bush looking for the coast. And um, I'm not sure that he ever found the coast uh, because Melville Island is, is quite a large island, really. Um, it's the second largest island after Tasmania, yeah. I was reading the other day. Yeah, it's uh, so quite a large landmass, and he, um, he put it down a fair bit inland. So he wanders around in the, uh, the bush for about two or three days, and he stumbled across a uh, group of Aboriginal women that were out there looking for native bees and honey and all this sort of stuff, scared the hell out of them. And as a gesture of sort of saying, I'm your friend, you know, like, you know, I need your help. They had some children there and the story goes that he actually picked up one of the babies and was sort of bouncing it around and trying to talk to them. And these women are absolutely terrified that he's going to do something to the children. And so then he takes his watch off and gives it to one of the women as a gift. And he's trying to say to them, I need, I need you to get me to the coast. I, I need to get to the beach. As it turned out, the, uh, his aircraft carrier uh, did send a seaplane looking for him. They circled the air. They came back a couple of times, apparently, um, and they weren't really concerned about that because they knew that they uh, destroyed just about all of the air cover in Darwin. They couldn't see him, and so they just decided that he was dead. They couldn't find the aircraft, and so they must have assumed that uh, the aircraft was totally destroyed as well. He stayed in the camp where the Aboriginal women were for that night when he first came across them. But when he woke up, they'd gone. They had just got up in the dark of night and slipped away because they were probably absolutely terrified, uh, and for good reason. When the Aboriginal men arrived at the camp, he was still there and they, um, they took him prisoner. There was a group of them, but the, the leader of the group, Matthias, he basically uh, captured Toyoshima himself. The others sort of hung back, sort of seeing what this Japanese man was going to do. But apparently Toyoshima just gave himself up. That should have been the end of the story for Toyoshima. Like so many other prisoners, he could have seen out the war in a POW camp and returned home in 1945. But fate had a very different plan in store for Hajime Toyoshima. Japanese military code emphasised death before dishonour, and the greatest dishonour of all was to be taken prisoner. When questioned by his Australian captors, Toyoshima gave a false name, Tadeo Minami, and he hid his true identity to avoid bringing shame on his family back in Japan. For Toyoshima, shame would soon become all-consuming. He was transferred to a POW camp near the small Australian town of Cowra, and while there, wrote a revealing letter to a prison guard who had become an unlikely friend. I would like to thank you very much for your hospitality, and particularly the story of Japan, which you have told me from time to time. I hope you will do your best for your country in the future. I want to thank you very much for the kindness you have shown me. I have spent healthy and peaceful days with you until now, but now I'm quite prepared to die anytime. I think this is the time to say goodbye to you. I can really hear that my mother in my hometown is saying, you die for the mother country. Then I want to say sayonara. To have a life for 25 years, or for 50 years, or 100 years, it doesn't make much difference for me unless I can do what I can do to satisfy myself. 
I have no regrets to die. For Toyoshima and the other Japanese prisoners at the camp, the shame of capture was becoming too great to endure, and they longed for the glorious death they had been denied on the battlefield. They saw themselves as ghosts, trapped between a life they could never return to in Japan and the noble death so many of their comrades had received in battle. On August 5, 1944, they took charge of their fate. A thousand Japanese prisoners armed with baseball bats and kitchen knives charged the fences of the Kaura prison camp. The Australian guards opened fire and a bloody battle began. By daylight, the camp had fallen silent. 231 Japanese prisoners had been killed, along with five Australian guards. It was the largest prison breakout in history. Toyoshima, who had blown a bugle to signal the start of the breakout, had been shot through both legs and crawled into a ditch as his comrades fell all around him. He quietly smoked a cigarette and then took his own life with a knife he'd stolen from the kitchen. For the great Zero pilot, the war was finally over. Today, Hajime Toyoshima lies in the Kara Japanese cemetery, along with his comrades killed in the breakout. Back in Darwin, the rusty remains of his aircraft are easy to miss. Tucked in a corner of the aviation museum, a small sign is all that reveals the intriguing past of this twisted collection of aluminium and steel. But like so many great relics of the past, the story is there if we choose to look for it. In this humble artefact, the story of the attack on Darwin, the Kaura breakout, and the brave life and sad death of Hajime Toyoshima lives on. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast and visit livinghistorytv.com for more great history content.